Is the game on? Yes. Awesome. Okay. So uh, we're here to talk about, uh, you know, garbage. And um, I didn't have a particular agenda. I know Simone was talking about uh, maybe a potential benchmark. Is Alexi here? He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Excellent. Because, you know, he's got the Epsilon thing going on, which is like really cool. Um, you know, I think he envisioned it for testing to begin with, but, uh, oh, there's a the man. Uh, but I think there's actually valid production use cases for this, uh, given the current direction of things. So that's really nice. And of course, we have their Azul representative uh, with uh, ZGC. How's that working out for you guys? It's brilliant. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's good. It's it's working really good. It's like um, I'm happy that a lot more people are interested in in low pause or what we call pauseless GCs, which actually do contain pauses, but those, but pause less. Well, yeah, which is by itself is almost like a brand name these days, isn't it? Um, because I think IBM has a collector that they call as pause less. Um, so, and fortunately, we don't have anybody from IBM. And yes, um, since Epsilon was Epsilon GC was mentioned, that's something that we had internally for. I think you know, six or eight years that I can remember, and it, it has served really uh, the purpose of testing to understand the cost of well GC, but also the cost of injecting GC barriers. So how can we count? How fast can we run if we could eliminate for whatever with, with whatever whatever reason we could eliminate some of the barriers that are part of the GC algorithm? So it's good to see it's now a part of OpenJDK as well. Um, it's uh, I'm I'm glad that this isn't the default one, as on April first was suggested, but uh, we're getting there, right? Cool. I so I only have one question. It's like my hot topic this year is well, my uh, button topic is hot uh, weak references. Okay, so. So I just wanted to set the the uh, context for this talk. It's like okay, so there's a new GC coming out. Uh, I want to say like JavaScript frameworks, but almost. <laughs> so uh, the key point is that these new GC, GCs are maybe not well known, or many people doesn't know about them. So the idea is to talk about them, and so primarily. We know that there is G1, which is the default uh, collector now in the JDK, uh, but there are two efforts, one from Red Hat, which is Shenandoah, which is a low-pose collector for large chips, very low-pose. And then there is another effort from Oracle, uh, the collector is called ZGC, which is again uh, a very low-pose uh, collector for big heaps. Z it's, uh, yeah, it, they officially they call it highly scalable garbage collector, but I guess the main reason is to distinguish the two from the user perspective, so that they wouldn't be looking for two law pause collectors, but it's just sort of a branding. But in reality, they're also shooting for law pauses. And you forget about ZGC. Uh, Epsilon, yeah. Yeah, and then there is another effort um, called Epsilon GC, which is um, basically the idea is to remove the GC work from, from that, but still have all the hooks plugged in into the runtime so that you can, you can for example, use Epsilon GC with a very large heap that you know, because you know your application, that you will never need a garbage collection. So that's, you just run yeah, for so, so the GC is actually a misnomer. Uh, GC is more like automatic memory manager, so it actually handles both allocating and reclaiming the memory. And Epsilon is basically does the first part of the allocation, but doesn't do any reclamation, which means it's super ultra, ultra low latency non-GC for a very, very large heaps. So. Now, because you were talking about barrier, and does it allow to remove the barriers as well? Yeah, yeah it, it doesn't have any barriers whatsoever. 
Yes, because it doesn't need to do any GC, it doesn't do any bitters what, whatsoever. Uh, most of the, well, all objects never die, which means you don't have to do weak reference processing, for instance, and all weak references are alive. You get pinning for free because if you don't collect, objects don't move, so you can just if you have GNI critical array or something on the object, you don't need GC locker, for instance, to prevent GC from running because there is no GC and object never moves, etc., etc. Yeah, it has down downfall is that most of the copying GC is actually optimized for locality and epsilon does not. The way you allocated your data is the order in which they will stay for the rest of the life of JVM. So, uh, so here's some here's a topic that I think uh, most people are, are not aware of, and I think you brought it up quite nicely or alluded to it. Was that um, when people think of garbage collection, they, garbage collectors, they think of ah, oh, this is how I get the memory clean, and what people most ignore are the effects of allocators or mutators on the picture, and the balance of work that needs to be considered between the allocators and mutators and the actual uh, collectors. Uh, do you want to comment on that? Um, okay, yeah. So, um, GC work would be much simpler if allocation if applications did not allocate at all. I mean, our work would be cut out for us if that didn't happen. Um, the trouble with um, as, well, stop the world collectors have it easy because when you run out of memory, you just say, well time to do stuff, you get into the pause and you do the cleanup of the heap and you unblock the, uh, the mutator and it all goes well. If you're running a concurrent collector which is supposed to do the GC cycle concurrently with the application, you have an interesting feedback cycle or rather the absence of. If you have this, the GC threads that are running concurrently with the apl application, that means if you have the limited heap and you probably have, uh, in some cases the application could outpace your GC Right? What do you do then? Well, there are different approaches to do. Uh, you can uh, do the ratio uh, when the mutator threads could run and GC threads could run, the metronome or something like that, kind okay, the scenarios. Um, you can paste the allocations. That's what Shenandoah does. It just tracks the GC progress, and if GC progress was not enough, um, it just stalls the allocation every so every so little, um, and then if allocation still outpaces the GC, Shenandoah just says, "Okay, we as the concurrent collector have failed to maintain concurrency for you, and this is your GC pause right now, and we will complete the cycle under the pause, and it will be the nice record in your GC logs, which will say, well, you know, we we basically screwed up. This is your pause." Um, yeah, some collectors like, like ZGC who don't have the stop the world fallbacks would just stall the allocations until um, GC has chance to clean up the, the, the mess. Um, in C4, Pauseless and ZGC, given that they are storing the forwarding data outside of heap and they can reclaim the collection set immediately, it's, it's, um, it does make sense to do that because the chances are that the first page you have freed will satisfy the allocation. Um, in ZGC, it's not always worked that well because you still have to wait out for concurrent mark to finish b before you can start relocating objects. I guess when you have generational stuff like C4, or something like that, um, you still have the same problem. You still have to mark a part of the heap before you relocate from that, but chances are the generational, the young collection would be shorter, so you would wait for, for shorter things. So yes, this is the thing that you don't appreciate about allocators. Right. So, right. And, and I think what you see is with G1 is that uh, the uh, garbage collector starts co-opting the when it, when it gets outpaced, it starts co-opting the uh, mutator threads to do some of the work for it. Uh, for instance, is be RSET refinement. Um, yeah, the, uh, you want to say something about it? Oh, yeah, um, so part of the algorithm is that uh, the fix up of references for two objects that have moved 
if GC uh, thread didn't get to do it first and mutators were, were started, mutators will actually do and, and patch the reference. So it means that well, the mutator does does extra work. It, it therefore runs slower, but it sort of helps the you know the GC threads. I did want to mention one. I want to point one thing. You keep talking about the allocation rate versus uh, the amount of garbage that GC threads can process. There is an interesting overlap with what compilers can do which is namely escape analysis. So with the things like escape analysis optimization in top tier compilers, um, it is possible that even though you, in the user code you have explicit creation of an object there for allocation, it may not be actually happening because the VM can prove that this object never escapes from this given scope and therefore it does not need to be created. So. Um, so sophisticated compilers can help to reduce the amount of work that GC threads need to be doing and this is actually very visible uh, specifically with uh, let's say Graal that does partial escape analysis so it's sort of it's a escape analysis on steroids if you will um, and uh, it is very clear that some of the performance benefits that, that are being observed there are not from the better GC algorithm, but it's actually from less amount of garbage being created for the exact same application because the compiler is more sophisticated to eliminate some of that allocation. Yeah, yes, that's true. But the perspective of the GC guy is that um, you are dealing with the case when all those tricks failed. Uh, sure, escape analysis is great. If it cuts out allocation rate, we will take it. Uh, if value types would uh, trim down the allocation rate, we will take it. It will again. If we don't have any allocations, GC works is freaking easy and for any GC algorithm. Yeah, I should say even GC even algorithm. serial GC will work fine if you don't do any allocations. And in fact, um, some of the people have, uh, especially in like in the past, let's say five or seven even years ago, uh, they were coding in a way they would use object pools and other sort of techniques a way to eliminate in the hot path or in the long run they would eliminate so that there would be practically zero objects being allocated. Uh, the problem with that is uh, because you never code on raw JDK, well even JDK right now it has so many, so many ways to create objects that you can't really un understand how, or how they come from. It is increasingly difficult to code without actually creating new objects. Um, pretty much any, any, any new paradigm that you use, you know, uh, streams, lambdas, uh, a bunch of proxy methods, uh, you, you always end up creating objects. Sometimes you end up creating inner classes you don't, you're not aware of. Yeah, so the, the one of the things that you realize when you work on concurrent GCs is, is that it kind of, you realize that your intuition about GCs is mostly bound on the stop the world GCs when you say, if I want to have lower average or some percentile pauses that I don't really want to inflate the heap because at some point I will be faced with collecting a whole lot of crap from that humongous heap that I have. So if I run stop the world collector, I don't want to have, I don't know, heap more than four or 10 or 20 gigabytes, whatever is the fancy number these days. For concurrent work, for concurrent GCs, it's, it's the other way around. The, uh, the, this, this thing about outpacing, application outpacing the GC, on the flip side means that if you have enough room in your heap to withstand allocations while concurrent GC is running, you are actually running better because you can do more concurrent work. You don't have to do as much as aggressive pacing, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you, give, you give the heap more, you give your application more heap and it really, really runs better. Yeah. And this runs counter to uh, what people in the cloud are wanting to do. Uh, I mean, there's a recent proposal uh, from uh, Gelastic oh, yeah. actually to put in a full GC call to uh, G1, which I thought was uh, my personal view on it. It's like, 
uh, right, you know, right problem. It's a good, interesting problem, and everything like that. But just a, a, what I call a brain dead, horrible solution to it, you know, uh, because it seems like, you know, when I'm tuning, I'm spending all my time fighting against a full GC from ever happening, and now these guys are intentionally putting it back into the system. It's like, I'm like yeah. no, that's like big red flags. Yeah. Let's just say they have the different set of values from you. They they want very low memory footprint at the expense of whatever CPU time you spend doing but, full GCs. And in, in this case, they don't really care about uh, you know the, uh, the the tail latency problem that they're creating for their clients because sure. of that, right? And and I think we're seeing this also on Amazon or the big pushes in serverless. And I, and I actually think this is a, sort of a, um, historically you go back to power companies trying to get people to save power because not because it was saving their customers money, it was more because it meant that they didn't have to build a new plant to satisfy increased demand. And it seems like Amazon has now hit, and other cloud providers have sort of hit these demand cycles where they're going to have to build a lot or buy, invest in a lot more infrastructure. So they're looking at how can we do reduce memory footprints or, you know, because that's the expensive part of the hardware in order to get things to work, uh, and on the other hand, um, yeah, to, to, to avoid the investments or making the, the longer term investments that they need to make in order to properly yeah. support things. And how does that fit with garbage collectors? And how does it fit with live data sets and live data set effect sizes? Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a very good thing to talk about with concurrent GCs again. The trouble with footprint is that you really want to have GC to, to knock out the floating garbage or whatever. And the problem is if you have the stop the world GC, then you really have a weird trade-off. Um, either you have lower footprint or you have more frequent pauses which wrecks up your latency. If you have a concurrent GC, you can make the GC cycle just for the spite of it. I mean, if you want to have the GC every five minutes, for instance, to knock out the floating garbage from your idle application, if you have a concurrent GC, you can do that, even if load comes right in the middle of this GC cycle. It's not a pause anymore. You will just run this application. And this is why both ZGC, Shenandoah, and I believe C4 do this kind of uh, periodic proactive GCs because there is no harm in doing that, and the footprint improvements on top of that are really, really great. In Shenandoah, even, we have like, these special heuristics which kind of tunes the knobs you just say, I want to run in the most compact mode that you can get, and just, just tunes the things inside of GC, which makes this periodic GCs more frequent, makes the collection policies more aggressive, blah, 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 which kind of shrinks down your footprint and the cost of elevated utilization, et cetera, et cetera. So for concurrent GC, it's not that much of the trade-off. You still trade off CPU cycles versus footprint, but not latency versus footprint, right. and this is but there is also another caveat to this is that people tend to think of their applications uh, as, you know, okay, this is my life set. My life set will fit into application if I specify something like XMX, I don't know, 20 gigabytes. Uh, so, okay, they think uh, if I know that, let's say, with XMX 19 gigabytes, I'll get out of memory exception. Uh, but with XMX 20, I will not get out of memory exception. So it's got to be a good value. And it's good, into, like, good enough to get by. But uh, when you run on a very low free memory, uh, at least in case of C4, uh, you tend to do a lot of evacuations. You tend to do a lot of um, yeah, copying of, of live data. And then the cost of GC becomes very visible. So this is a sort of counterintuitive because when people put instances into a cloud, they think, oh, I got to squeeze everything. And you know, if I don't need more than this amount of XMX, I got I, I, I to reduce to the minimum possible. This is counter to the other goal of people that people have with uh, trying to have low pauses in, in with their garbage culture. It's, it's same with G1. If you give it like longer time budgets and you give it uh, larger heaps, then it tends to do much better, simply because it has more room to to balance the workloads out. And if you shortchange it anywhere, 
it'll delay the work and delay the work and delay the work and then all of a sudden it's got to do it. And when it does it under those conditions, it's, it's a hurt moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I have a, a question, an actual question that we were wondering. Um, so I'm, I'm working on the cash and on the cash we have a, a off heap tier where you can store your stuff, which is of course slower since you need to serialize to go there, and there's a malloc implemented there that works. So we were wondering if I, I could just throw all that code to the garbage because right now the new GCs like ZGC, Shenandoah, etc., could cope with the the heap that would be used instead, and uh, I'll be happy ever after. Um, uh a year ago, um, I was talking to the guys who are basically doing in-memory caches, trying to understand why the hell they do the off-heap thing. Well, I had my idea why they do this. Um, and sure, uh, from performance standpoint, they are dealing with the out-of-box GCs that will still have a very highly populated old gen in which you will have to do some sort of full GC and that will freck up your tail latency and, and something like that. Um, and some of those guys actually said to me that the, while the performance was the tipping point for them to move to off heap, what they really wanted, what they really got from there is easier persistence of this, of this whole thing. Because if it's the binary blob outside of the heap, you can just serialize it by your own means and dump it and recover from it. Um, and general reliability thing because you can just squeeze more. Uh, the thing is, you can do, say, byte arrays on the Java heap and reinterpret them as the data on your heap. Um, and that works fine. Um, you can probably make it a little more denser on the uh, off heap, even if. If, and if you do that for persistence anyway, that, that's the way for you to go. I would very much like to see the experiments for the in-memory caches that would say that with a good uh, concurrent GC, performance-wise, the on-heap solution and the off-heap solution are closer together than they were with the non-concurrent with the non -concurrent GC. I would really like to, to see that. Um, Yes, but I do understand there are pressures that are not related to the GC performance in going off heap. Um, another addition to that is that historically, uh, GCs were not particularly good at handling large heaps. Um, so people have built this mental model: if I'm, if I, my, if my life set is very big, um, and even if my sh a machine could afford, let's say, having a terabyte heap. Uh, the GC pauses would be absolutely unacceptable. With modern GC algorithms, uh, that is now not an issue, and uh, therefore uh, this pretty much eliminates the need for some of those off-heap off solutions. And, and the other thing that you have to consider that if you are working with the um, ZGC Shenandoah, C4, etc., they are all are tracing collectors. They are all tracing collectors. They have to walk the live heap. So if you know the life cycle of the things in your off-heap storage more or less exactly, that would probably mean that at some tipping point, the overheads of walking through, work, walking through the on-heap thing by your concurrent GC would still incur some CPU overhead for you to walk through, rather than you are having the intellectual educated guess what are the life cycles of the elements in your, in your storage. Yes, in, in effect, they are running. Uh, you, you will be doing your half-complete half bug-ridden implementation of reference counting collector. But yes, that's what you would probably do if you want high performance in the, with a large number of objects, et cetera, et cetera. So can I? Uh, I, I, did a, I did a big data startup. We did in-memory, in-heap big data. Uh, but we made it collector-friendly by shoving it all in a giant byte arrays. Yep. And so there were very few objects to be collected. And so all the collectors do very well with it because the actual set of pointers to trace are very small, even though the old gen was hundreds of gigabytes. Yeah. Right. What about guts? A little bit of accuracy. If you have even fragmented. Oh, sorry. You still have a bit of the accuracy problem, right? Because you wouldn't be able 
Oh, I, I guess you can compact between the byte arrays and you can do smart stuff, right? I think we didn't bother, um, but we didn't need, we didn't run byte arrays more than a, a few megabytes at a pop, mm -hmm. so that you freed or didn't free, you know, on the orders of megabytes a shot, yeah. not on the orders of hundreds of gigabytes a shot. Yeah. Uh, and so the collector didn't have any yeah, trouble with so that. So there are some granularity considerations that you, you have to do, but yes, I, I do understand if they are, for particular workloads, are, are good. Uh, well, uh, speaking of this workloads, it's actually a very good test for any GC. It's just you do the LRU cache in your memory, and you see how most collectors just fall down on that workload, unless it, it's really so the other piece of that is in a big data workload, it's typical you do have epochs of work yep. that are very well understood by the developer for which there is an obvious cut point for which after this spot, all the temporaries that were used in the calculation are dead, yep. right? And you want to kill them as cheaply as possible. Yeah, 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 yeah. be careful with that. <laughs> so um, for, for Hazelcast, I think they were well, two or three major reasons. One of this is you want to get rid of references because of walking, walking all the references. Um, the second thing is you, have a, you, you often have a more compact representation of the data, which is probably what you said for serialization. Um, and the third thing, I just, no, it was, it was not persistence for us. I just forgot the third thing right now. Um, <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. Um, but um, actually, uh, based on what Cliff just said with the big byte arrays, we actually built a prototype where we exchanged the, the off-heap implementation with an on-heap implementation just using two gigabyte byte arrays. Um, and you used the long pointer. The first one was the index of the actual byte array because we just allocated multiple ones. And then you have the, the um, lower uh, four bytes are actually the position instead of the byte array. And, um, Interestingly enough, that's a little bit faster, even though all the unsafe stuff gets completely inline, but you still have microseconds faster access to, to the data. And it works perfectly fine. Um, at that time, we got the best experience with G1 um, because you just got like two gigabyte objects that are getting straight allocated into the humongous space and they're just lying around and being never moved again. But yeah, that that. I no that, no no. But you're you're kind of dodging the uh, the, the dodging the issue. Well, I would say right now I don't I don't really care about compression. That nobody cares. It seems at least all my clients. Uh, but and then it's true that you can store byte arrays and you will be faster than of heap. But my my personal goal would be just to scratch all this and have a concurrent hash map, a wise one that just handles all my caching and, 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 and be happy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You just reminded me of the third one um, because the third one is actually life cycle. Especially for caching, you know exactly the life cycle of the objects. It's probably the only or one of the few use cases where you exactly know the life cycle. And that, for that reason, the GC implementation, reclaim implementation is actually fairly easy. Yep. Yep. So, uh, yeah, just maybe a naive question, but about the, the big array in uh, on heap. What about the the card scanning overhead? About this, because you you you're storing a large life set in the heap, so you're increasing the time for card scanning. Time for what? Sorry. Card scanning. You you know you the card table, and you you you're scanning the card table because you have a large live set so you for example for minor gc um, like for the page uh, uh, collector you're increasing this overhead or for cms but i don't know for the, for g1 with the region if this is like a smaller overhead or whatever so we ran heaps of you know 200 300 gigabytes team basis uh, old gen collector was typically clocking in at one or two seconds, which for a, sort of a big data, you know, ML interactive, but but usually batch for production, but interactive otherwise, yeah, a couple seconds. What the hell? I don't care. And I don't. I couldn't tell you if that was card mark time or what it was. It was too small to care. 
Okay, uh, because for, for, for us in a, in a in trading system, it was uh, like uh, to reduce the minor GC process, it was like uh, a thing that we, 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 we look, look at. Because uh, if we like pulling the object and we're increasing the life set, we're increasing the minor GC because of the curve scaling. So that's something. M minor that GCs at. were always uh, uh, on the order of microseconds for us. So, so we would have objects that were on the order of one to ten, but probably two or three megabytes a pop to fill up a hundred gigabyte heap. You have some whatever thousands of them. Um, it was all instantaneous. All right. I was thinking, ah, and uh, I was thinking, and we actually on the heap we use a, a, a concurrent hash map, a normal one, and we tried a non-blocking hash map, uh, which is basically a byte array, <clears throat> and it's actually much faster. <laughs> Uh, the only problem is that we're not able to use it because uh, the uh, the compute is reentrant, so it's spinning. There's an optimistic locking there, and with with the caching, there there's some some stuff that needs to be done in uh, in the transaction. So so far, we're we're not able to use it, sadly. But yes, it's faster, of course. <laughs> uh, can I? You have a GC question. <laughs> <laughs> I do, <laughs> actually. Uh, I was going to ask you, or particular, may, maybe Ivan knows the answer. Is like, um, you know, there's there's some noise now on the mailing list about actually being able to define uh, memory uh, memory spaces on alternate devices and actually, oh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> when Cliff does that, you know, we're in trouble. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, yeah, there are proposals mostly pushed by Intel and other folks to say that, hey, we have this fast, non-volatile memory. Why can't we use it for something interesting? And the idea to segregate heap into, you know, cold and hot storage is not really new. If you follow say even the public J1 work, they had the notion of these archival regions that they tried to implement and I, I, I think it went nowhere from that point. Uh, but yes, but the idea is sound. It's just, you know, if you have lots of slow memory, relatively slow memory that is non-volatile, which is not really needed here, or you can just push part of, swap the part of the heap, part of the data there and teach your GC to go with it, um, whether it's whether there is a policy that can actually reliably guess what data is called or hot is uh, for toy example is okay for the LRU caches is probably runs off the rails, um, but yeah maybe you okay have yeah yeah, yeah yeah so, so there's just an obvious like thing that's been around the block for a thousand years, right? D disk is the new tape, right? You know, memory is the new disk, you know, you know, non-volatile RAM is the new memory, right? So, so, so there's always been this tension of caching hierarchy layers. This is just another caching hierarchy layer. Treat it like another caching hierarchy layer. What is the right cache policy you want to have? LRU is known to have sucked. There are various other policies that when the workload looks like LRU, LRU will, the, the policy will look, act like an LRU. When the workload looks like streaming, there's, you know, there's, a, there's a better way to go here. This is just a cache policy problem. But is it all, you said it's a new layering, um, but it's all new. We always had operating system page, pages which could be swapped out. So this is just a, it could be seen as a, as a quick uh, page swap out location. I think, interestingly enough, uh, years ago I worked on a system that actually used uh, what we call orthogonal persistence. So what you do is you'd have something that was rooted in one of these uh, persistent uh, pages that would be persistent, and it would just be the garbage collector would sweep everything, you know, copy, you know, when it went through the mark sweep, it would just basically copy everything that was um, uh, attached to that particular root onto one of these uh, persistent pages and stuff like that. And uh, it actually made for a... Uh, a, a great system for persisting objects. And stuff. So let me throw out that uh, 
in the land of paging and garbage collectors, if your heap was paged out, the GC cycle, the next GC cycle would kill you, right? So, so if you have a fast read and a slow write, this might actually work, but I don't know of any work that sort of reliably does a good job where significant fractions of the heap that need to be garbage collected are also have a huge latency. And, and how do you sort of not have a GC cycle that takes the heat death of the universe to go visit all the slow, off heap, whatever, off slow memory stuff? Well, I, yeah, I get what you're saying, but I, I guess in this point it was actually, shall we say, a better mechanism for deciding what actually should be persisted or kept on these alternate, in these alternate memory caches as opposed to what needed to be uh, more volatile, and it also meant that this was done sort of automatically under the cover, which means that you didn't have to do anything extra or special to have it happen. You just needed to make sure that you were connected to one of these things that was rooted in, in, in this particular space. I'd actually love to hear how it worked. Yeah, yeah because uh, when I hear, every time I hear it work magically, well, it's I, I actually hear it sucks in so many cases. Um, <laughs> it's the garbage collector that actually did the work. So that's the magic was the garbage collector just did what it was. Yeah. Supposed to uh, so the so the better alternative I, I see is that is that um, if you have non-volatile things, uh, maybe you just need a more user APIs for dealing with it. I mean, if you if you yes if you have the persistent system when you know the life cycles of your object, you can just as well go and allocate the byte buffer that is over persistent memory and push your data there out of the heap and you are done. You don't have to involve magic GC in this. It's not magic GC. Which will suck, by the way, in many cases. <laughs> but, it, but no, there's, there's I, yeah, I, I, I guess what we're saying is that, okay, so let's put memory management back into the hands of the developers uh, uh, with that type of attitude, which is, which is our good, code to C++ then, right? Right. It's, it, well, yes. Okay, but it, but the, but I mean, the point to going to a garbage system is to, is to actually re remove the need to understand object life cycle, uh, and and just you know focus on that which is important, and so you know moving to more orthogonal persistence, we're using the garbage collector to actually help you, in uh, do this and actually. You know, still use the the, the, the characteristic that the garbage collector does understand object life cycle, albeit accidentally, um, is I think um, uh, it actually gave some uh, really nice properties to the system, uh, that, and the performance on it was actually pretty reasonable for the time. Yeah, it hinges on the assumption that GC's assumption about object life cycle is the correct one, which in some cases is true. In some cases, it's done. Yeah. Well, the reference is hard. Um, I have a question about persistence, though. Um, so we keep talking like as, as you know, going off heap as as a nice solution to that. But um, when you have, let's say, an object with final fields, and you persist it, and when you restore it, you have to reassign the value to, pers to back to the final field. Which is an unsafe operation, which therefore, which therefore kills some of the optimizations that would, because. Do you want me to go down that path there? So, so a couple of things. If you serialize an object, okay, now it's on disk. I whip out my Emacs. I edit your file. Your final fields are shit anyhow. So, so blow off the final thing. Not blow it off from an engineering good software standpoint, but trust that it's truly final. That bullshit. It's, it's not actually final. But the next thing is you loaded it back in, and now you had to go set it with an unsafe. Fuck it, that's in your serializer library, and you effectively managed the programmer expectation that final is final. You just had to go through the horrible unsafe thing to get it loaded. But the compiler still cannot trust that it is final, because I know from experience the hard way that there are some big, popular, well-known Java frameworks that immediately use reflection to set final fields, and a compiler will just, you know, fuck up on that, and exactly that work was done while it was still at Azul. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so, but what I'm saying is that um, when, when it's, everything is in memory, the, the front time can do a better job of tracking if is the is final final, uh, whereas when things go off heap and then you're restored, then it's the same thing. It's the same damn thing. Yeah, it's 
you can open Emacs and do the fiddling with the dump and then load it back. You can just as well go to GNI and fiddle with your heap, or you can do unsafe and fiddle with this heap, or you can do reflection with our security manager and fiddle with that final field. It's the same then thing. The, the diff though is that the, 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 the latter three are all going through VM, so VM has a way to track this. If you're doing this off heap, uh, then VM no, has, has not, no way to control not, it. Not with GNI, it doesn't. With J9, does it just know that it went to J9? You know, this this reference escaped into J9 land, so something could have happened to it. Oh, I don't even need the reference. I mean, if, yeah. we we are good senior uh, experienced programmers. We sure can poke into the raw memory in Java heap and fix things there because it's the same thing to do when you are high on coffee. But yes, people will do that, and VM would have and no chance to know about. And this. then VM compiler developers get a get a bug report, or your your you miscompiled something. Um, uh, your your compilation is, is effectively wrong. Huh? So now something completely different because recently we had a discussion about uh, storing ha passwords securely. And if you look at Java API, you always have very un not nice API where you, we use byte arrays so that we can clear them later so that they don't stay as long as in memory. So that if some, something is swapped or dumped, nobody has access to it. But what if we, we have, have garbage collectors that do copy collecting? It stays there. Is there any solution for that? Or basically, it makes this whole play with byte arrays stupid. <laughs> I, I, I think the security uh, consideration, and I read the, uh, it's the, I think the one of the OWASP rules basically to say if you do passwords, do not do strings, but do char arrays. And you can understand from the implementation standpoint is that if you have a string, it has more possibilities to get shared because string the duplication. Um, if for characters you have less chances for this to stay along, but uh, can GCs are conservative. And can, so can, can I stop this conversation before it goes anywhere? Spectre and Meltdown will just wipe through all that. They don't care. They're going to read your memory from a remote process, no matter what the hell you do, unless you shut your x86's, all those performance features off. You can read through every security thing Intel ever does. You can read through every possible from a drive-by web page, all another process's memory, every piece of string, car, secret, crypto, all of it. It's all just open anyhow. So the GC is the least Way, useful way that I would go read your secret data. Yeah. You can also uh, get, get the uh, DRAM chips out of the socket, put it in the freezer really fast. <laughs> Drive by web pages are well, hell, way the hell easier. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's actually an answer. Thank you. Okay, so, no, well, just, just to answer you, like I think today there was an email on security dev exactly about this. There's a guy that posted and said, given Spectre and everything, should we have some additional support from the runtime to handle passwords I in, a, in a different way? So I just went through the eCoop conference on the workshop on side channel attacks. I talked to the guys at Chrome and, and Apple's, uh, you know, the, the JavaScript guys who are really at the forefront of this problem because they are squarely like getting hit and they are looking hard at serious performance hits that would be necessary to prevent various levels of Spectre, but they've come around to, you know, there's still some open attacks that are easy to implement. They have working implementations. They have no defense at all for it. They have no clue. So they, they're looking at 30, 40, 50% slowdowns in execution speed to cover some set of attacks, and they have attacks which they have no clue how to defend against. And they have working, they have a working drive-by shoot down. I can go just read your process. So, so we're not yet at a spot where we know that it would be useful to tackle it in GC until you can prevent attacks that have totally unrelated to the technology of the different pieces, right? Yeah, but there's still a simple rule, right? If you want to store password and you and you want to store any data and you don't want anyone else, anyone else to see it when you're done, zero it out. That's about it. I mean, and exactly these drive-by attacks totally like like plow through that. They're they're really good. It's it's fun to watch them in action and understand how they work. So in particular, I poke at their web page to make you do a crypto thing. 
and because you're doing a crypto thing, you go get your key and do your crypto thing. While you have your key for this short milliseconds, I get to read some bytes, and then I do something else for a little bit, and I poke you again, and do something else, and poke you again. And after, you know, whatever the read rate is, some kilobytes or megabytes a second, I surf your process and I got your data. So, as everywhere is security, you don't get the 100% protection. You just complicate the attack against you. So, if you have the password in the string, that's probably the easiest to attack because um, G1 will string deduct the string, put it in the string table, you just dump it and it, it's there. So what do you, um, how do you make this attack harder? You do char array, okay, char array can still be in the heap, somebody can heap dump it with, with all the dead objects and it's still there. How do you protect yourself from this uh, simple attack? Well, you zero it out, now it's not there. Now you, you will have the complicated attack when you can have the, uh, still leak the bits of that password, uh, even so temporarily. This attack is, still possible the cost of it might be much greater than the you know the value of your password so the problem is the cost is known now and it's known to be fairly inexpensive and that's the issue if it was really expensive then these mitigations would actually work because it would drive the cost to a point where it's no good but that's not where we're at so maybe, maybe specifically about the moment where we have a compactation of the heap and the password accidentally is copied somewhere like and it stays there and you can zero it because it will be like you don't even access so maybe that a question maybe we should process passwords hashing and that stuff on of heap so the specter and meltdown don't care about that <laughs> it has to sort of be in a different kind of memory or in a way that the processor shuts down all its speculative execution mechanisms, like all of them. Every, there's like 20 in, in the standard x86 now, speculative execution mechanisms that have some sort of internal state. Every one of them has been known to be, well, I can't say everyone, most of them have been known to be useful in a drive-by shooting that bypasses all hardware memory protections and doesn't care if you're on heap or off heap or in process or out of process. Yeah, so imagine the world when all CPU bugs are fixed for a moment. Um, so yeah. What do you do when you have the stale copy of the objects that is not accessible in somewhere in the heap because you just copied from there? And this is actually the recurrent question. Um, I know that at least for Hotspot, there are debugging facilities for GC which just <laughs> fill out the unused space with some magic words just to figure out that you access this heap. Whether we should elevate this to security option saying that, you know, if GC just moved the objects from some space in the region, it just fills it out with whatever AVX uh, 1K instructions that we have with some values. I, I think there's a, an easier, stronger answer, and that's, unfortunately, the add types. So this is a security type. I don't care that it's slow to access, but take whatever care you have to do to defeat all processor optimizations before you touch the memory and make no copies from the GC and the JIT doesn't keep copies floating around and all the right things happen, same as we do with Volatile, right? It, it goes through the GC and it goes through the JIT and it goes through the VM. So the, I think we, there's some sort of security type that says go slow and carefully. Which I believe uh, was the purpose of this mail to security dev. It was actually, I think, based on type, like this, this guy is special and so must be treated specially. Yeah. Um, I've been wondering, because uh, for me it's a bit, th things are a bit different. You, you, let's say you're, you're a web server and you're attacked. So to be able to use Spectre and Meltdown, uh, it means you're, you're, the machine is heavily compromised already. Yeah. You, you need to get there a little bit. It's even easier for so for GC for me it's a bit easier because you, the the JVM has been compromised, which is a bit easier to do. No, nope. what? You, you got a web ad served from a third-party web server. The web ad puts up a nice flashy banner and in the background can totally read through every firewall, every sandboxing, every possible defense, and any piece of any of the processor's memory, independent of virtual memory space, and physical memory, everything. Why? Well, I can show you with, uh, I have slides. I can step you through how these attacks work. They're, they're kind of, once you figure out how the, the it works, you understand how bad it is. But the, the, there's no compromising of your product. You have a functional, correctly 
run sandboxing of JavaScript or JVM, or, that's all there. The OS's VM protection's all there. There's no compromise, and they totally burn through all that. And I can show you in five minutes, 10 minutes tops about how they work. You, you want to go there? <laughs> Not, I don't know. Not, 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 not today, but that's a really interesting session for tomorrow. So please propose ah. that. I will. I will. I will actually. I will. But you're, you're required to be there. <laughs> All right. Do you have a question, Christoph? So otherwise, I want to bring back the discussion back to a little bit to GC and. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, but. You, <laughs> um, no, actually, you guys can stay because um, it was one thing that I was discussing with Alexei before the session. It was actually, um, can we use these collectors, uh, especially Shenando as EGC already? Are they production ready? Whatever that means, can we expand on that? Uh, and what, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think you should. Uh, because uh, for Shenando, for instance, we know it is functionally complete, we know its performance is good, um, we are so, uh, um, we think it's stable enough so that we actually ship it with RHEL and it's supported with RHEL, so in Java uh, 8 and it will be in Java 11 as well, shipped with RHEL. For ZGC, it's under experimental flag in the mainline OpenGDK. It has to be enabled by the special build switch, but Oracle, I guess, will ship its binaries with ZGC. And I think you should try it. Um, for Shenando, we know there are no critical bugs that, that corrupt your heap and crash your applications. That might be performance potholes we don't know about yet. So, and we wouldn't know about, about them until you try and tell us about it. Uh, I believe ZGC and other collectors are pretty much in the same spot. And GC work is usually, uh, at least performance-wise, is the work in progress. So you always find interesting things, interesting behaviors that uh, the multitude of applications step into that you might probably do better in GC. But otherwise, both collectors are ready to use, so use them. If you have latency problems, it's stupid not to use them. I mean, just sitting, you're sitting there waiting for some official blessing for the community as whole that some collector is really solving the problem when you have a burning problem on your hands, it's just silly. You can, you might as well try to try experimental GC and see if it fits your thing. Um, we have adopters in Shenandoah which basically come to us and say, hey, you know what, I picked up the nightly build that you have on your server and by the way our production was running for two months on this nightly build and it's fine and we would like to report that it completely, completely works for us. Uh, and there is a tiny, teeny bug in your current lightly that you would like to fix. So that's the notion of stability that you can get from this kind of GCs. Um, you pass benchmarks, you don't crash them, you pass uh, serious applications with it, you pass whatever notion of GC testing is done for OpenGTK GCs, etc. Yeah, so try it. I guess this is the moment I get to brag a little bit. Um, <laughs> yes, so C4 is also in production for God knows how many years. Um, uh, meaning, well, I think we shipped for on x86 for the last eight years, so uh, C4 is eight years in production. And also, I think out of all the GCs being listed here, we are the only ones that can work with GDK7. Um, so if you're for whatever reason stuck on JDK 7 and there are people in the industry that are in that situation, so C4. No. Yeah, that's the thing about uh, say Shenandoah. If you look at the download stats, well, you can't look at it, but I can. Uh, and the, and the adoption, adopters that come back to you, you will realize that most of those guys are really running on 8 because 8 is the, our current LTS thing. Uh, whether they would move to 11 anytime soon is the open question, which will be resolved after 11 releases. So if you have uh, the OpenGDK 8 or 7 and you want low latency, that kind of limits your options here. 
So if you want seven, then it's only C4 and, and Zing. If you want eight, then, then it's OpenGDK builds from Red Hat with Shenandoah. Uh, and if you up to 11, then you have choices. And there you can compare and pick whatever fits your use case better. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this is a question about the uh, Zing C4 uh, collector specifically. Um, yeah, do take this the right way. But um, <clears throat> the question I have is that um, we've run into a number of people that have actually tried this, and the one thing they actually um, comment on is that the mutator throughput has been in, in, impacted by the collector. And can you comment on that as to why that happens or wh what, what they're actually experiencing? So this is very much case by case. Um, like we mentioned before about the memory pressure that in case the memory configured in a way that um, that requires mutators to cooperate with uh, with the uh, with the garbage collector threads um, that puts extra that takes some throughput from the mutators themselves. So that's one. Uh, as two, um, we do have some heuristics about um, in 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 house heuristics, I don't remember exactly out of top of my head, but those are single digit percent. That's the cost of 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 barriers of placing barriers inside the code that essentially materials run. So we're talking about a few percent here, and of course your mileage may vary in, in different situations. But um, I would not say so. Let's let's put it this way: when we do in house performance measurements and we do you know throughput measurements of the overall you know benchmark or application, we are comparing uh, with whatever is. Well, oftentimes, whatever is default available on OpenJDK or other products, and we are running us, meaning that we, we compare throughput, and, and some, some places were better, some places were slightly worse, and all of that with guaranteed latencies that, uh, that we pretty much promise on. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, okay. so, that, so I think it falls back to the uh, almost standard marketing things we hear from Gil all the time. <laughs> But yeah, but can, can, can I comment also because I have also prediction uh, test with C4 for long years, sure. so I can I can uh, I can comment on on uh, on Ivan about this. Um, so we we put, we put C4 on on, on production uh, for a couple of customers and we are very satisfied with this. And for the, for the benchmark, well at first, when when we try uh, Zing, uh, we get an application low latency like 100. Microseconds to process order on the on the on the, on the market, and uh, when we when we test thing, we get uh, like uh, thirty percent difference with hotspot on the on the latency, um, and that's because of the LVB. So we we, we work with uh, with Azul to to see that the, when they disable the LVB, uh, we get the same performance at hotspot, but when we activate the LVB, we get a 30% uh, difference on the latency, because this application is doing a lot of uh, access in memory, and we, we pay the price for this, uh, because we are measuring at microseconds level. So they change, Azul's change the way the LVB is loaded into memory to use a register instead of um, a thread locals, I think, something. And it uh, goes down to like eight nine percent difference between outspots, which was very very good. Uh, so for us. stepping outside of hopefully stepping outside of marketing, when we t when we compare and you know do, do the shootout for different VMs, whether we are comparing uh, JIT compilers or garbage collectors or even runtimes, it's not that we are comparing like these guys have done. Good job. These guys have not done. They, they still have things to finish. These are actually different algorithms, and what it means. Well, th there are similarities like CGC, C4, but uh, with JITs and 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 to large extent other garbage collectors, uh, there are there are differences. What it means is that in different situations, different applications, different patterns, uh, the results might be different. So if you are really curious about 
you know, it, it basically makes no sense to trust in somebody else's word and say it worked there, so it must be here. It's it probably works okay, like if let's say Cassandra, uh, uh, if first somebody that Cassandra with this JVM works well, probably in your instance Cassandra will work with this JVM also well. But um, when it comes to like different applications and and different frameworks, it really the only the only thing to do is really measure yourself. I don't trust. Uh, just because Cassandra worked well there doesn't mean that here, I don't know, Spark will work better on the same JVM. It's, 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 it's all Apple, it's all different fruits, not just apples to apples. Uh, yeah, um, and one of the things about this, the, the mental model of our GC performance, the very simplistic one, is that yes, you have to do GC work, and you will have to do this GC work whether you're concurrent in stop the world anyway. If you're a tracing collector, you have to walk through the heap anyway. You have to copy object, etc. For concurrent objects, for concurrent collectors, you still have barriers that kind of uh, allow you to do concurrent cycle while cooperating with the running application. So if you look at this model, you will realize yes. Ah, okay. Uh, you will realize that in some cases, when your GC pauses are really, really low, for example, if you have the fully young application which doesn't have anything alive in the heap, so your marking is fast, you don't have anything to copy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that means that the costs of the barriers define the difference between stop the world GC and concurrent GC, which means that in these workloads, the stop the world GC would provide you more throughput because it doesn't pay for barriers and it doesn't uh, really wreck up your latency because there is no GC work to do. Yeah, so in many cases, I don't know, some of our customers uh, come and say, well, you know, we will be running this concurrent GC because we heard the concurrent GC is the, is the best thing since sliced bread. And then you turn on parallel GC on their workload and you have like the bump of two-digit percent because they don't really need that concurrent GC in their application. So this is something to, to consider with all this ongoing concurrent GC work. There are many workloads that do not need it. That I, be I believe the spec workers, are if anybody keeps track of those anymore, but all spec workers are still set with parallel, with, uh, with parallel GC, which is not concurrent. It actually itself stops the world and, and therefore it just it gives the best throughput. But this talk was primarily about the low latency GCs, which allowed this cost to happen. Yep. Yep. All right. Simon, wrap up. <laughs> oh, the host owner. Where is the host owner? So, um, yeah, uh, wrap up for this. Um, so these new collectors are available, are ready to use, I think, and uh, you need to enable for some uh, additional flags, etc. But the key point is that they are, let, let's say, this word. If you have latency problems, go try. Yeah, them. if you have latency problems, uh, go try them out. Uh, so starting from uh, the Shenandoah, uh, ZGC, uh, Zing, uh, they're all into this space, and therefore try them out and report back if you got any problem on those. Um, yeah, that's, that's a robot. Thanks.